Hello, this is uh, um, the presentation on the two challenging problems and the problems that were uh, uh, gave a significant number of students difficulty. On the last of the microeconomics problems, that's the problem set on public goods and common resources. Um, the two problems that presented some challenge, and what I mean by that is the average score was below 84, 85%. Um, all the other problems, everybody scored, you know, very high, but these two particular problems, we did have average scores below 85%. So I wanted to go over these and give you this video, this opportunity to view um, my discussion of those problems, uh, you know, uh, at your leisure, or if you wanted to do so. So, as I said, the problems were number four and five. Number four was about voluntary contributions towards the public good. And it presented the following problem. So, Niha and Teresa are considering contributing toward the creation of a botanical garden. Each can choose whether to contribute $300 to or to keep that $300 to the garden or to keep that $300 for a weekend getaway. Since the garden is a public good, right? in other words, a public good, not excludable, not rival in consumption, both Niha and Teresa will benefit from any contributions made. Specifically, every $1 that either contributes will bring each of them 90 cents of benefit. Right. For every dollar of contribution, they get 90% of that, or 90 cents of benefit. Since the weekend getaway, on the other hand, is a private good, only the person going on the getaway benefits. Right. So if either person chooses the weekend getaway, that person alone will receive a $300 benefit. All right, and so we want to figure out, let's consider the scenario in which both contribute to the garden. And this was actually this was described in the question. You weren't asked this. this. This information was already given to you, but we'll go over it. So the first scenario would be, what if both Niha and Teresa contribute to the garden? Well, then if they each contribute their $300 to the garden, right, the total contribution will be $600. The individual benefit, remember, for every dollar contributed, each individual benefits 90 cents or 90% of that. So the individual benefit will be 90% of 600 or $540. Right. And the combined benefit, therefore, 540 for each, the combined benefit for Niha and Teresa will be 1,080. So if we, the first table presented in the problem was the combined benefit for Niha and Teresa, right, um, under the possible scenarios. And we have just looked at scenario one, in which both contribute, right, so that is that Niha contributes and Teresa contributes, that's the upper left box here in the matrix. And the combined benefit for the two is $1,080, um, again, if they both contribute. Scenario two is the lower left quadrant in the matrix. Well, what happens if only Teresa contributes? Teresa contributes and Niha doesn't, right? And this scenario, again, was described or given to you. These numbers were given to you in the question. You weren't asked to provide these, but let's go over them. So if only Teresa contributes to the garden, then Niha's benefit, right? She will um, get spend the $300 on the weekend getaway and get all that benefit for herself of $300, right? But because Teresa is contributing to the garden, contributing $300 to the garden, Niha still benefits from Teresa's contribution in the, in the, on the order of 90 cents per dollar contributed or 90%. So Teresa contributes $300. Niha gets a $270 benefit uh, from the garden, from Teresa's contribution, for a total benefit for Niha of 570 Teresa's benefit, meanwhile, she does not get the weekend getaway. Instead, she contributes to the garden. But she contributes $300, but her benefit is $270, right? So what happens is that she, uh, she just like Niha, she receives the same benefit. It doesn't matter that she contributed and Niha doesn't. She gets the same benefit from the garden. It's a public good. So her total benefit is $270. So therefore, the combined benefit is $570 plus $270, or $840. Now, again, so we put that in the lower left quadrant here. And again, these numbers, everything so far, this, this part was given to you, right, um, in the question. You didn't have to do this, right? Instead, the question was asking you to fill in these two right side boxes. What happens, uh, uh, you know, what happens, you know, in this scenario, right? Um, and so scenario three was what if only Niha contributes to the garden, right? What if only Niha contributes to the garden? And in that scenario, Niha's benefit would be, again, only Niha contributes. So Niha does not get the benefit of the getaway. Instead, she spends her $300 on the garden, but she gets $270 benefit from that. So for a total of benefit of $270. Right? 
Whereas Teresa, benefit, Teresa this time does not spend in the garden, gets to go over a weekend getaway, gets private benefit of $300, benefit from the public good, the garden, of $270, so Teresa's total benefit is $570, right? which means the combined benefit is $270 plus $570, or $840. Right? And so the value here in the upper right is going to be $840. This is the combined benefit, and it's not surprising it's exactly the same as down here, because down in the lower left, Nia contributes, but Teresa doesn't. Up here, uh, in the upper right, you know, Nia contributes and Teresa, but Teresa doesn't. So these, but in either case, it's one person contributing, the other one doesn't. And since this table is the combined benefit for Nia and Teresa, it's not surprising that the combined benefit is the same. That said, of course, you know, uh, here, for example, uh, Teresa's benefit exceeds Nia's, and down here in the lower left, Nia's exceeded Teresa's. But the combined benefit is the same. And in the last scenario, scenario four, what happens if neither contributes to the garden? That's the lower right-hand scenario here. Right. And in that case, if neither contributes, right, then Niha's benefit is she goes in the weekend getaway, um, and it's $300 benefit from the weekend getaway. There's no benefit from the garden because nobody contributes to the garden. Right? So her total benefit is $300. And the same is true for Teresa. Right? She only gets the private benefit of the weekend getaway. Right? So the combined benefit is $300 plus $300 or $600. Right? And so, therefore, the value here in the lower right is going to be $600. So that was the first part of the question. It just asked you sort of to fill out, uh, they gave you two of the boxes and asked you to fill out the other two um, for the combined benefit. They then you were asked the question, which outcome gives the greatest combined benefits to Niha and Teresa? Well, we could just look and say, okay, where's the greatest combined benefit? Well, the answer is right here, right? Obviously, um, if, you know, where they both contribute, the biggest number for the combined benefit is 1,080. And that is where both Niha contributes and Teresa contributes, right? So the answer is the outcome that gives the greatest combined benefit to Niha and Teresa is the uh, one in which both contribute to the garden. Now the question asks you to look at the individual benefit for Niha. So it gives you another t similar table, if you will, or matrix. But now it asks you, it actually fills out again two boxes in the matrix and then asks you to fill out the rest. But whereas before we were calculating the combined benefit for Niha and Teresa, now we're focusing on just on the individual benefit for Niha for each of the four scenarios. Scenario one, again, this information here is exactly the same as the previous slide. I'm not uh, changing anything. I'm just uh, now, instead of putting the 1080, which is the combined benefit in, we're looking at the individual benefit. and and. The scenario one, where both contribute, is again the upper left here. Nia contributes, Teresa contributes. And instead of putting the combined benefit into the matrix, we're putting in the individual benefit for Nia. And it happens to be the individual benefit is the same because they both contribute, um, is 540. Right? And that's the individual benefit for Nia if both Nia and Teresa contribute to the garden. Scenario two is what if only Teresa contributes? So Teresa contributes and Nia doesn't contribute. Right? And so that's in the lower left here. Right? And before we put in the combined benefit of 840, but now we're focusing on the individual benefit for Niha, who, if she does not contribute, she uh, gets the getaway and gets the benefit from the garden too, that from, from Teresa's contribution for a total benefit of 570. Right? And so that's the number we put here in the lower left. Um, the ben individual benefit, again, for Niha, for not, if she does not contribute, Teresa does. Scenario, and, and, oh, and, and incidentally, again, these first two scenarios were provided by the question by Apple. You did not have to answer those. But you did have to do scenarios three and four. Scenario three, where Niha contributes and Teresa doesn't contribute. So only Niha contributes. This is the upper right. We look at, again, a Niha's benefit here, and Niha's individual benefit, and it is 270, right? That's what she gets if she, she does not get the benefit of the getaway. She only gets part of the what she contributes to the garden, to the public good. And... Finally, what if neither contributes? So this is the lower right, neither Nia doesn't contribute, Teresa doesn't contribute, we're in the lower right. What is the individual benefit for Nia? Well, it's the same for either of them in the diagonal, or the off-diagonal, however you want to look at it. I guess it's the diagonal, um, that uh, when they both are doing the same thing, they're going to both get the same benefit, and the individual benefit is going to be 300. Right? And so this is how you would fill out that, that uh, matrix for the individual benefit for Nia under the four different scenarios. Now, then the question you were asked after that was, okay, so let's think about what's best for Niha, depending on what Teresa does. So if Teresa decides to contribute to the botanical garden, what should Niha do to maximize her individual benefit? So it's saying, 
what if T reached a contribute? So we are here only focusing the left side of this matrix. Ignore the right side. And these are the benefit. The, remember, this is the individual benefit for Niha. So if Teresa contributes, then Niha, what should Niha do? Well, we see here if she contributes as well, she gets a benefit of 540. But if she doesn't contribute, she gets a benefit of 570. Right? And so we're only comparing those two numbers. For Niha's choice, if Teresa contributes, then Niha's best option is this 570, is to not contribute. Right? So the answer is the best option for Niha is to not contribute to the garden if Teresa contributes. But then I ask, what if Teresa does not contribute? What if Teresa decides to not contribute to the botanical garden? What should Niha do to maximize her individual benefit? Okay, well now we're looking at the right side of this matrix saying, look, what if Teresa doesn't contribute? Right? So we can ignore these numbers here on the left and now just Niha's got to decide whether to contribute or not contribute. Right? If she contributes as, if she, Teresa doesn't contribute, if Teresa contribute, contributes, ugh, she gets an individual benefit of 270. If she doesn't contribute, she gets an individual benefit of 300. Right? So again, clearly 300 is bigger than 270, so that Niha should also not contribute. So if Teresa doesn't contribute, Niha should also not contribute. Right? And so the answer to this question is, what should Niha do to maximize her ben individual benefit? The answer is not contribute to the garden. Right? And note that either way, 570 is bigger than 540, 300 is bigger than 270, no matter what, Niha was better off not contributing to the garden no matter what Teresa did. Right? And by the way, you could do that analysis for Teresa. We didn't put in the individual benefit of Teresa, but, but it's a symmetric game. It's exactly the same. The point is that no matter what the other person does, right, you are, in this scenario, no matter what Teresa does, Niha is always better off individually but not contributing. Right? And no matter what Niha does, Teresa is always better off individually by not contributing. Yet together, remember, with the ma they maximized their combined benefit if they both contributed. Right? So these results illustrate which of the following. The free rider problem it asks you, does it ask you the why markets are efficient, the creation of positive functionality, or the tragedy of the commons? Right. Well, and again, remember, what did we just see? We just saw that the, the, the question so far has shown us a couple things. First, that the best outcome, the for the total combined benefit is if they both contributed. Remember, the, the combined contribution was 1,080, and that was the biggest number. If they both contribute, it was the best combined outcome. Right? But it's individually in the best interest of either person to not contribute. Right? This was like our public good game in the class, where is we could all do best overall if everybody put all their, all their points into the public pool right? um, and none into the private account. Right? But individually, no matter what everybody else does, it's always in your best interest to, to keep everything for yourself in the private account. And that's the idea, is that you benefit from this public good, whether or not you contribute to it. And that, of course, is the free rider problem, right? Is that not, no individual, whereas collectively, yes, it's in our best interest to provide the public good and produce the public good. Um, because you can't exclude any individual from the benefit of the public good, there's, and there's no incentive for anybody to individually contribute. You're better off not contributing and free riding. Right? And that's the free rider problem. Right? Um, and so that's certainly the answer. But let's go through the wrong answers and understand why. Well, certainly, um, it doesn't be as obviously wrong. This is not all straight why markets are efficient, because in fact, in this case, right, we have a situation where, um, you know, we what would have been efficient would be to both contribute to the uh, uh, botanical garden, because that would produce the maximum total benefit Right, but when people follow their individual self-interest, right, they actually don't contribute to the public good, and they um, end up having a, an outcome in which the remember the combined benefit from the table, the combined benefit when both contribute was 1,080, the combined benefit when neither contributes was only 600, about half as much. Right, so there's a huge inefficiency here because of the free rider problem in public goods. So not why markets are efficient, right? And, and in general, markets are not efficient in the presence of things like externalities and public goods. What about the creation of positive externality? Well, um, there would be a creation of positive externality. There is a creation of positive externality if you contribute, right? If you contribute to a public good, you are, in essence, creating a positive externality for others, right? But the, the, these results illustrate the opposite, right? There is the potential for a positive externality that's not created, right? That's why the inefficiency occurs, right? And so certainly that's not the case. And lastly, the tragedy of the commons. Remember what the tragedy of the commons is. The tragedy of the commons deals with uh, not public goods, but with common resources, right? The idea being that um, 
with common resources, you know, that, that not only can't you exclude somebody from using it, right, but their use of it diminishes the other person's benefit. Right? Now, in this particular case, right, notice that the benefit they got from the public good was the same whether, you know, no matter what, right, um, and was 90% of whatever the total contribution was. And there was no reduction in the benefit if one person used it or, or, or didn't, etc. Um, but even if there was, right, understand that these results, there could, theoretically, right, this could be an issue, this garden could be certainly an issue, where one person's use of it diminishes the value others get. And there, should be, there could be a tragedy of the commons with this uh, botanical garden described in this question. But that's not what's illustrated by these results. These results don't say anything about tragedy of the commons, they, but they illus do illustrate the free rider problem. Right. So tragedy of the commons could arguably be present in this scenario. You could describe it. But, um, in fact, in order for the tragedy of the commons to be present, however, first, there actually has to be the commons, right? And this sort of results show you that, you know, nobody's going to contribute to the botanical garden because it's not in their individual best interest, even though it's in the collective best interest. So there's no commons for there to be a tragedy about in the first place, right? Uh, that said, if there was, right, you could have the tra a tragedy of the commons situation, right, where individual consumption of a, of a common use resource uh, diminishes other people's benefit of it, but that's certainly not described in this question, right? So that's not what occurred in these results. These results simply illustrate the free rider problem. Right? So that was question four on that problem set. The other problem, or the other question on the problem set that was challenging was question five, about sharing the cost of public good. And here, the scenario was the following. Right? Four roommates are planning to spend the weekend in their dorm room watching movies. Right? Um, they're debating how many to watch. So again, four roommates. So they all live together, I guess, in one dorm room, right? Uh, and they're debating how many to watch. And here's the willingness to pay for each film, right? And so it gives you, you know, for Judd, Joel, Gus, and Tim, right, the benefit or the value they get from watching each film, right? And so, you know, the idea is that it, the, the first film Judd will get, and obviously it doesn't really matter what films there are, I guess, but the first film that Judd watches this weekend, he got a benefit of $7, second, six, then third, five, fourth, four, fifth, three, and so what you see is in each of them is what we call, of course, diminishing margin utility or diminishing returns, right? That first film, the second film, after you've watched three or four films, come on, I mean, you know, there's, there, there's not much benefit, right? So that's the first thing to notice is, of course, that the all of them exhibit diminishing marginal uh, utility or, mar or willingness to pay as the number of films consumed goes up. Right? I've also noticed that in all cases, Judd's willingness to pay is higher than Joel's, is higher than Gus's, and is higher than Tim's. Right? Um, and the other thing to notice is that that even Tim, who you know, doesn't benefit that much even from the first film, right, the willingness to pay is bounded above zero, right? So there's no negative willingness to pay. There's a, the, the implication is that, that nobody's willing to pay to avoid the movie. I guess, you know, if Tim doesn't want to watch it, he can put his headphones on or do whatever or, or even leave, right? You know, but um, but the point is that uh, it, it, it's becomes, you know, it's not relevant for the question per se, but it's relevant for something I'm going to talk about in a minute, right? Is that notice that the the implication is that there's there's no negative willingness to pay, so that so the, that basically they're not willing to pay anything, but it's not that they're willing to pay to avoid it, right? And then so you also and, the, and this wasn't in the question, but I've added here the total column, right? You add up the willingness to pay. So this is the total willingness to pay, right? The total benefit from the first film, right, is 17, 13 for the second, etc. So this is the information that you're given, right? except you're not given the total column. You can certainly calculate it. And the, the question, the first question asked is, within the dorm room, is the showing of a movie a public good? Right? Well, the answer is yes. Remember what a public good is. A public good is not excludable and not rival consumption. Well, this is not excludable. Right? You could keep other people out, but they all live there. None of the roommates can be prevented from viewing the movie. Right? Um, and uh, they, you know, I mean... I guess it's theoretically possible. You could lock them out. You could tie them up. You know. But the point is that they all have the right to be in that room, and they all can watch the movie. Right? Um, and, but it's not rival in consumption either, right? So the idea is the fact that you're watching the movie really doesn't diminish my viewing, unless you, you know, you are going to have running commentary and you know talk loudly or make it less enjoyable. And that's uh, you know, in, in many senses, I would presume that these people have chosen to be roommates, and there's some benefit from watching the movie with somebody else supposed to be the opposite. But, but the bottom line is that there's certainly one roommate's viewing does not affect or diminish the value or the ability of another roommate to view the movie. So it's a public good. Now it says, if it costs $8 per rental, how many movies should they rent to maximize total surplus? Right? Total surplus, the total benefit minus the total cost. All right, well, let's bring that table back up again. 
Well, here we have the the again the willingness to pay for the first to the for these up to five films, right? And the total willingness to pay is summed up the willingness to pay the individuals. This is the total benefit that they get from watching the first film is seventeen. The total benefit thirteen. The total benefit is the total value, right? To all four of them combined, right? To watch each of the movies and the that's so the. In fact, it's a total marginal benefit, right? In other words, the idea is that you watch one film, the total you've increased total uh, uh, benefit by 17. You watch another film, it's increased the total benefit of the four of them by 13, and so on, right? But what's the marginal cost? The additional cost per rental? Well, it's eight dollars per rental, right? And so you can compare these benefit to the cost. Well, should they rent the first film? Oh, well, yeah. Right? They get a benefit of 17. They only pay 8. That's certainly... 17 is bigger than 8. So yeah, it's worth it. The benefit exceeds the cost. So yes. What about the second film? Well, yeah. The benefit here, the total benefit is 13. It exceeds the cost of 8. Yeah. the It will increase total surplus if we rent that movie. What about the third one? Well, again, um, 9 is bigger than 8. Right? So yeah. So the third film would also... Uh, increase total surplus by only one dollar, right? The total benefit is nine, the total cost is eight, or the, the, the marginal benefit of that third film is nine, the total marginal benefit across all four of them is nine, the marginal cost of renting it is eight, so yeah, that's worthwhile. But then for number six and number five, it's not worth it, right? The, you know, there, there's some benefit, at least to Judd and Joel for these last two movies, but the, the, the even, but the combined benefit does not exceed the cost, it's just not worth um, the eight dollars it costs to rent the movie. Right? Where they're renting a movie for eight dollars, you know, uh, I'd like to know, but you know, uh, we'll just suspend disbelief there. Right? And so the answer is, they should. The question: How many should they rent? The answer is three. The first three make sense. The last two do not. Right? This is just sort of thinking at the margin type analysis. So then you ask the follow-on question: So suppose the roommates rent the optimal number of movies, which is three, right, and split the cost equally. How much will each roommate pay? Well, this is just simple math problem. Once you've had the previous question right. Right? Three movies times eight dollars per movie it gives you a total cost of for all three movies of twenty-four dollars. Three times eight, twenty-four. So how much of they how much will each roommate pay? Well, there's three movies, four roommates, twenty-four dollar total cost divided by four roommates, six dollars each. Right? Alright, so again, if you got the three movie question right, then uh, then then this should have been easy. Right? Now the question is what is each roommate's total willingness to pay for the optimal number of movies? Okay. Um, another, so, again, bring this data up again. So now we figure out what is each roommate's total willingness to pay for the optimal number of movies? Well, the optimal number we just said was three. So we don't even need to, I've ignored, I've deleted the, the, the rows on the fourth film and fifth film. But what is the total willingness to pay for each of them to watch all three movies together? Right? Well, for Judd, seven plus six plus five, the total willingness to pay is 18. Right? For Joel, 12. For Gus, six. For Tim, it's three. So you just add up, you know, their total willingness to pay, you know, for each to watch all three movies. And then you can sort of add the total. So the combined for all four of them once pay to watch the three movies is $39. All right. Well, then the question asks, well, what is the surplus each person obtains from watching the movies, right? But what do you mean by surplus? Of course, after, the idea is after they have to pay, they each pay $6. To watch three movies, we said each person in the previous question would have to pay six dollars. So what is the surplus? Well, it's just the ones to pay minus what they actually do have to pay, right? Um, and so their surplus is going to be Judd is eighteen minus six or twelve. Joel is twelve minus six, which is six. Gus's surplus is six minus six or zero. Tim's surplus is three minus six, which is negative three. So notice this. this is important. Now you're, you're realizing that Tim does not like this outcome. Right? It's good. Collectively, we decided, we pointed out that the optimal number to maximize total surplus right, would be three films. But that doesn't mean it maximizes everybody into individual surplus. Right? In fact, Tim is worse off than he would have been if he had no films. Right? So that's the whole idea of the, the, you know, of the public good is that, that it, the benefit, the overall benefit, it maximizes total surplus. doesn't mean that each individual does. Right? Um, you may not. You may be have to pay for a public good, like when you pay taxes, you pay for our public goods. You may not like, you know, some of the public goods that your tax money goes for, and you be, might be worse off because of it. But the whole idea is that collectively, as a group, you know, that we decided the benefit exceeds the cost, and so it's worthwhile, right? So again, this is the, this is the actually individual surplus. We can also calculate, by the way, the total surplus. The total once paid was thirty nine dollars. The total cost was uh, was for the three movies was twenty four dollars. So 39 minus 24 is 15. So that's the, the total surplus across all four uh, roommates. All right. So then 
you're saying, so this in this scenario, you then said, okay, well, how would this actually work? Would this actually work? In theory, that's what should happen. In theory, we should definitely rent three films. But, you know, how do we go about doing this? Because Tim doesn't want this outcome, right? Um, how do we get this to happen, right? Um, and also keep in mind, we don't know these willingness to pays. Right? I'm putting these out here, but it's not like people walk around with the willingness to pay stamped on their forehead, right? You know, we have to sort of, we can ask them, right? Um, or we can put them in a situation where they reveal their willingness to pay. Right? And that's what the, then, so then the last question, so I said, you know, let's think about this. Suppose the cost is to be divided about based on the benefits each roommate receives, right? Because it does seem, if you split the cost evenly, it does seem a little unfair, maybe, because Tim is certainly suffering. You know, Tim is paying for movies that he doesn't even want to see, right? Whereas Judd's getting a pretty good surplus here. Judd's a movie lover, or I guess, right? And so suppose the cost is divided up based on the benefits each roommate receives, right? Well, how would you know what the benefit each roommate receives is? Well, the only way is to ask them to want to pay. So if I said to you, okay, look, you know, we each benefit differently, so what we'll do is we're not going to make everybody each pay $6, like we said, you know, the $6 cost. Instead, if you value it more, you pay more. If you value it less, you pay less, right? So I want you to tell me your willingness to pay, and then I'm going to charge you based on your willingness to pay. Well, obviously, if I'm going to charge you more, the more you say it's worth to you, right, then you will have an incentive to understate the value of the movie, right? Because the, the bigger you, you if the, so if I if I say I'm willing to pay a lot, guess what? I'll pay a lot. If I say I'm not willing to pay much, I won't pay much, right? And so the problem is that you know you might would you would presumably like Judd to pay more than Tim, right? But the, the you can't just ask them because Judd has an incentive to pretend he's more like Tim, right? So I'm not willing to pay that much, right? Now that said, he, of course. He wants to make sure the movies actually do get rented. So, but he certainly doesn't have any incentive to, you know, overstate, you know, his willingness to pay. In fact, you know, he could say he's willing to pay, you know, less, you know, um, and, and we'll talk about that um, in more detail in a minute, right? But the bottom line is, is if you charge people based on their um, the benefit they receive or the willingness to pay, then they won't be honest. They have an incentive to understate the value of the movies. But now suppose. We do agree to, you know, in advance, right, obviously, yeah, uh, in hindsight, this wouldn't work because Tim would not be too happy. But suppose they agreed to advance, hey, let's choose the efficient number. So we, won't, we, won't, we won't even, whatever the efficient number is, right? So in other words, you know, let's not, t before we even ask you about your willingness to pay, let's agree right now. We are going to ask everybody the willingness to pay. We're going to sum up those willingness to pay. And... Then we're going to buy, for every movie, for the, the total marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost of $8, we're going to rent it. Deal? And then we'll split the cost evenly. Is that a deal? Okay. Suppose we made that agreement. Then the question is, if that agreement was made, which roommates, which movies will have an incentive to reveal his true willingness to pay? Well, actually, that's not the question. The question only asks you about Judd. If that was the case, would Judd have, be willing, you know, to reveal his or her, his, in, well, Judd in this case, his, true willingness to pay. So keep in mind that the idea is the total cost per film is $8, which means each of them are paying $2 per movie. So if Judd knows that he's going to pay $2 per movie, is he willing to reveal that, yeah, he's, the first film is worth $7 to him? The answer is yes, because the fact that he says it's worth $7, it's not going to make him pay more. He's already agreed. He's going to pay $2. And as long as the combined one is paid greater than eight dollars, he knows that's going to be it's going to be um, the movie's going to be shown, right? And so the answer is yeah, sure. Yes, he is willing to truthfully reveal that because uh, that will make sure that the movie gets shown. And he's no matter whether he says seven or two or one or zero or ten million, right? He's only paying two dollars if the movie is shown, right? So yes, he is a senator to reveal his true willingness to pay. The point is, as long as and that's true for the second film and the third film. Right? Because he is, in fact, willing to pay. He knows that he's going to pay $2 per film because $8 per rental. He's going to pay one-fourth that. He knows he's going to pay $2 per film. If he values it more than those $2, then absolutely he has no reason not to say, yeah, I'm willing to pay my $2. I think it's worthwhile. I'm, there's no incentive for him not to reveal his true willingness to pay. And that was the question that was asked in the problem set. And all you had to do was say true, yes, or, or false. Again, whether it's true or false. But the bottom line is that Judd has an incentive. To, he's willing to... Truth reveal his uh, true values, his willingness to pay.
But I, I just for my own interest, and so you understand the let's, let's go, let's look at Joel and Gus and Tim. What about them? Well, Joel, again, it's kind of easy for Joel. Same idea, right? Um, Joel knows that, that each movie he's only going to pay $2. You know, he's one of four people that are going to split the cost, right? And the fact is he's willing to pay at least $2 for each of them. So, yeah, go ahead and say, yeah, this is what I'm willing to pay. Right, um, add it up, and if the total is is greater than the you know, so but the idea is because I'm only paying two dollars, um, I certainly have no incentive to understate my willingness to pay. You could argue, you know, that the possibility of of one to overstate the willingness to pay, and we'll get to that in a second. But it turns out that that's not necessarily, you know, uh, um, going to necessarily be the case, right? uh, because in, in it's sort of in hindsight, it doesn't really matter, right? But but um, for Gus, again, so let's go for Gus. Certainly, if you think about it, for the first movie, he's willing to pay three dollars, right? And the cost is two dollars to him, right? The individual cost. So, so Gus said, "Yeah, sure, I, I, I want to let you know truthfully." Let's, you know, here for the second film, um, he's the value of two dollars. He'd pay two dollars. He's roughly indifferent, in it, but we can go one way or the other. But the bottom line is, you know, let's just the more interesting questions are are is the next one, you know, but. Yeah, let's assume that, you know, that he's indifferent, so he says, yeah, and it's $2, so no reason not to do the reveal. But now the next question is, what about when his willingness pays $1? Does Gus have an incentive to lie? Well, there could be scenarios. Remember, remember the problems that did not ask you about Gus. It only asked you about Judd. But in this case, Gus, right, um, does Gus have an incentive to reveal, reveal his, that his willingness pays $1? Or more, more directly, does Gus want to say something different? Now, clearly, he would not want that third film rented because it's only worth one for him, and he's and he's got to pay two. So he would like to have that not, film not rented. But because we talked about the fact there's no negative one in space, even if he said it's worth zero to him, you know, Judd and Joel, you know, combined are still worth eight dollars. So the movie's still going to be rented, whether he says he's worth one or worth zero. And so it doesn't really make a difference. The point is that, you know, Gus, you know, uh, I, I put a red check there just because it's interesting that Gus is willing to pay less than $2. You know, he does not want that third film to be rented, but given the benefit that Judd and Joel get from it, it's going to be rented anyway. And now going to Tim, Tim, again, you know, is sort of indifferent in this first film, but certainly it's worth $2, I pay $2, fine. And then now Tim is in the situation here with the second film where just like Gus before, right, it's only worth a dollar to him, but he's going to have to pay $2. Well, you know, no matter what he says, if he says it's worth one or with zero, right? Like I said, we sort of ruled out him saying it's worth negative, you know, five or something, right? But if it's worth, you know, he said it's worth one to him. Um, the combined benefit for the other two is already twelve. It's going to be rented, dude. Whether you whatever what you say, so he got no incentive not to tell the truth, right? And the same is true for this last one, right? It's going to be rented, no matter. Well, obviously. He has no incentive to say he's willing to pay more than zero, and we've sort of ruled out, you know, uh, just because it, you know, would be, you know, that, that we know bonus pays are all above zero, right? And so therefore, you know, uh, we sort of ruled out the possibility of saying you could say negative five, but then you're they know you're lying, so we can sort of sort of they rule that out, right? And again, like I said, it gets a little more complicated with these gut, these 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 red check marks here with guts and Tim, but the problem set question did not ask you about that, right? So I want to be clear that although there's some gray in this area. Right, um, the Apple problem did not ask you about Gus or Tim. It just asked you about Judd, right? And so, but that said, I'm saying even in the gray, right, it's reasonable to say at least given these particular values, willing to pay, nobody has an incentive to lie about the one that's pay for any of them. Right? They can't benefit at least from lying. They might not do it. And so, then the last question asks you. So this illustrates the optimal provision of a public good will occur, right, if individuals do not have an incentive to hide their true valuation, right? Remember, we said, when we said that, um, the, that the cost is going to be paid based on your willingness to pay, whoever is willing to pay more pays more, right? People do have an incentive to hide their true valuation, and the result is that the public good does not get provided, you know, even when it should be. But when there's no incentive for me to lie, right, and I, I might will tell you truthfully exactly what it's worth to me, right, then, in other words, what I pay is not impacted Right by what I report, then um, uh, there's no incentive for me to hide that true valuation. When that's the case, when there's incentive, no incentive for me to hide my true valuation, right? Then we can have optimal provision of a public good. Right. Now this isn't the cleanest of questions to illustrate that. There are some, you know, I could go into, you know, sort of 
possible manipulation, etc. But I think, you know, if we don't think you go too deeply into it at least, right, we sort of understand the point that the question is certainly trying to make here. All right, and so that is the question number four and five from the problem set on chapter uh, 11, I believe it was, which was on public goods and common resources, right? And that was the last of the microeconomics problem sets. So um, I will go over the, prob the challenging problems on the macroeconomics problem sets in class, but I didn't want to use time, uh, class time to go over this because, you know, again, it's a little bit water under the bridge. We've already sort of fall finished the micro. It's not necessarily something, that, it's not going to be in the final exams. So therefore, you know, there are certainly some students who really don't want to spend their class time on this. And so, um, and some people, you know, obviously don't really care. They want to get it right or wrong and, or they understand why they got it right or wrong and they don't really need to take up class time. But I've posted this um, online for those of you who might have been interested. So I hope it helped. Thank you.